So my name is Michael St. Vincent. You can find me out on Twitter uh, at Just One Ping. Um, I invite you. you know, this is going to be a discussion, so I have some things to say up front. But really, I'm very interested in everybody else's ideas because this talk is this is the first run at an idea I'm trying to build out, and uh, graciously given the opportunity to do it. Um, and as I walk into it. Hopefully you'll start to see why I think the talk is important. Whatever you get back to this is actually going to be what begins to build, I think, a, an important conversation in the community. So we're talking about building out a you know, career in the, in the bridge, building the bridge between management and, and staff and, and how that works, and then building a bridge across parts of information security. Um, Anytime I've started to have this conversation with other people, it's it's been interesting to see how people feel. I mean, you get a lot of very strong reactions. And part of it is because we say security, the security profession is, is hot in the marketplace. And I believe that's true. Uh, but what exactly hot means and how that translates varies quite a bit. Uh, you might expect it to mean, oh, you know, instant jobs for everybody, but it's not shaping that way. And the the impact sometimes is, is, you know, where you're working, you struggle with why is it not being treated better. Uh, a lot of us are also very happy to stay at the job we're at if, if we could just, you know, get things a little bit better. I've, I find so many people that have a lot of concerns, they're not job hoppers. They just would like to see it work a lot better. Um, but meanwhile, management has kind of got this big demand that you've got to keep your skills current all the time. You have to know all the stuff technology keeps pushing. Why don't you know this? And, and take on more skills. And yet, again, in this hot, hot marketplace, uh, we don't see the increases in pay just flowing on down. Uh, I don't know what the problem is. They say it's supposed to be happening, but, but not so much. So we more or less feel kind of like this most of the time. <coughs> Because this is the problem we have in IT generally and in information security, which is um, if, if you do a really great job and there's no incidents, and there's no breaches, and, and you don't have data loss and, and, and things breaking that you can't recover, then everybody says, yeah, you did your job. And when something goes wrong, it's like, I thought you said you had the security. So, so here's, here's what I want to do. I want to have this discussion, as I said, a little bit about me and, and why. So, um, okay, I've been in the industry about 25 years or so. Um, I've been an individual contributor. I've been a manager. Uh, I'm now kind of further up the chain. Please don't hurt me just because I'm there. Um, and, and I've seen this problem over and over at every level I've worked at. I've been in different industries. I've worked in the defense industry, worked in banking, I've been a consultant, um, I'm in hospitality now. Um, the problem is in every industry, it's at all the different levels. And um, the thing I've struggled with and the thing I've come to have a passion for is I want to build security teams. I, I want to get the people working together really well and enjoying you know, that, and, and I've succeeded sometimes. I've had some really good successes on building and having a great team holding together, and, and I've not been so successful in other places where I kind of never clicked. Um, and interestingly enough, if we go out of the profession, we look into volunteer spaces, it's the same problem. Um, but in the volunteer space, sometimes you see a lot more success, and there's no money involved. <coughs> I think it has a lot to do with, you have this, this real mix of skills. If you go to any con, if, if you ever want a real interesting experience, try to do what the leaders of this con or any other con have done, which is put something together. They're all volunteers. The skill sets are all over the map. And the interests are all over the map to why they came to help out. And yet it works uh, because people work really hard at working together. So here's my ask for all of you is, is, is as I kind of plow through this, I'm going to ask that you offer up your questions. And I don't have all the answers, so I'd also ask you know, the, the person beside you offer up their ideas. Um, as I said before, it's going to shape my talk as this talk keeps going forward. 
passionate about this idea, and I think we'll all get something more valuable, more valuable out of it than, than just me talking away about it. Okay, so what does the problem appear to be? Here's, here's my summary, I think, of what I've heard from people. Um, number one, management just does not have a clue what happens on the shop floor. They just don't get what's happening there. I've heard this over and over in, in various forms. And then, and then not only do they not understand what we're trying to deal with, they ask for all these things that have nothing to do with what we're trying to get done. And that's very problematic. And then sometimes you just wonder, does management have a clue what security really means? Um, there's a lot of little things that go into it. There's a lot of sidebars, and, and some of the efforts take way longer than we'd like to think they take. And then um, we're not getting the security done. They just, they just understand what security is. So with these concerns or complaints, I've kind of gone back, and I think I can package them into kind of these tiers. We'll start walking through them. The first thing is you know, my core beliefs about the problem. Welcome. Hold the microphone up. Okay, sorry. There you go. Some some uh, some of my core beliefs about what the problem is. First category, management doesn't know what's going on, doesn't recognize what's happening. There's a continual increase in the workloads that we have to solve. You know, the, the, the things that get asked every day is more and more stuff. We've got to figure out how to continue to automate those things. So here's where I'm going to start suggesting kind of from when you hear a problem, if you just hear the problem, try to hear you know, where the solutions are. Um, these are the easy ones. Uh, can we automate? And, and if there's a need for a tool to make that automation happen or, or if you're told, no, just do it this way, we've got to figure out how to have that conversation around getting something automated. Is what has been asked is the problem why it's not automated is because what they've asked for is they've asked for it in a way that's not something you can automate, but if you start thinking it through, the core of what they're asking for can be automated. And so we have to try to adjust to that because guess what? The increased workloads aren't going to stop. There's always going to be more to do. Another problem is how do we pick up the skills to do these new things that we need to do? Um, as a manager, I've struggled with the balance between we only have so much budget and we only have so much time. We just talked about and there's more work to do and people want training. And so if I take someone out to go get some training done, that means I'm going to lose time on everything else that needs to be done. It had better be worth our while. And then we've got to pick the training very, very carefully. And so we've got to make sure that we train more effectively so that what we're getting out of that training is, is immediately applied. Uh, I have tried to figure out, even for my own training, if I'm about to go to this thing, what am I going to get out of it? Uh, I just went to a training earlier this week. Here was this whole conference of all these great sessions, and the more I looked at them, the fewer I wanted to attend. <laughs> because I just didn't see how it was going to help me get anything better done if I had to get done. But I think if we can figure out what is effective training, and ask for that, you make a good case, managers probably can help you get training. I think the more you look at it, you'll probably ask for less and explain how it's going to be effective. And then here's, here's a real stumbling block. As we get worn out about they don't listen to us, because that's I hear that over and over, well, they just listen. They just don't listen. Have we stopped speaking? Um, are we still bringing forward insights? And how do we engage? I mean, this is the problem. If you have kids or have worked with kids, or you work with people that act like kids, um, engagement is a really big thing. Because if you turn to, you know, turn to a peer to get a problem solved, and you say, hey, how can we go do this? You're a smart guy, you're a smart gal. How do we solve this? And they just kind of go, meh. Not so interesting. We don't have the engagement, right? You probably turn to that person to ask for a solution because you really believed 
you have half the idea, maybe they have the other half. But if you can't get someone else to have an interest to start thinking about it, you're not going to get the other half of the solution. And so we have to think about how to drive engagement, either up to management, across to our peers. That's how we solve the problem of we're not getting insights from other people. We have to keep offering the insights. We have to try to figure out a way. If, if we offer an idea and they didn't take it, did they even understand the idea? Did, did we? offered up in a way that was interesting to the audience because communication communication is not about what happens on your side it's what happens on the other side yeah. so how do we get that engagement to occur so i think these are all kind of the front end of management doesn't understand this huge pile of stuff i'm doing and and we're still stuck in in trying to solve that first core problem um i, I just i don't know what to do with that <laughs> okay. Second big part of the core problem. There are tremendous demands. They kind of go with the workload problem. They kind of go with the, the understandings. But here's kind of a little different aspect. So think of this as, as kind of you know, something you pick up and you keep turning and looking at the different sides of it. How many of you have been asked to do an ROI analysis on some project? Yeah, it's like... And as you're doing it, you're like, I don't even understand the point of this. What do you want in, in, in an investment analysis? Don't you know you're not going to get a return? There's no money here. It's, it's going to be time or something else. It's an intangible. <clears throat> Is there a faster way to do return on investment analysis? If you ever get asked this, go ask the person who said, do this analysis. What's the framework? Give me what someone else did. Show me someone else who's got a framework. If they don't have a clue on the framework of the, the ROI analysis, can you ask them to go with you to finance or whoever's going to do the look at it and ask them who else is turning something in that makes sense to them rather than building it yourself? There are cases where building it yourself will kill you, and this is one of those things where go get the idea from someone else. By the way, if you can get the framework, that's a faster way to go get the ROI done because this apparently works, so I just have to kind of decompile it, put my information into it, and submit it, and, and hopefully that'll get the job done. As we do that, we're now having to turn to speak the language of the business. The question you have to ask yourself is, how can I be more relevant? How can this work that I'm doing be relevant to the business? Uh, I have had many conversations with very, very bright people. Uh, I've caught myself in this conversation. We're trying to express how very important this thing is that needed to be done or that I was working on. And they turn and say, well, okay, but we're in the business of widgets, whatever it is that we do. I mean, maybe you pluck chickens in your factory. And somehow security is in that business, but ultimately the business plucks chickens in packages and sells them. Well, if you cannot figure out a way how what you're doing is relevant to the business as a whole, try to start figuring that out. Uh, it's far too easy to turn back to the command line and do some really great stuff and, and get off into a hole that you become less and less relevant and then the gap between you and the people that are asking you stuff grows and we have to shrink that gap. Okay, If you're on uh, if you're on a red team, you're doing pen testing. You're probably doing some, some very creative attacks and you're coming up with all sorts of holes and they haven't solved this. But if you have not figured out a way to talk to the blue team side and make your attack relevant to them so they can start figuring out how to close that, then all your red teaming is a lot of noise. And this is no disrespect to red teamers. I think a lot of the, the pen testers uh, it's, it's, if you've done it, it's hard work, it's drudgery, uh, no less uh, so than a lot of tasks. You gotta write reports and then no one cares, but if we can figure out how to make it relevant on the other side, people start to care, they start to ask questions, and, and the conversation opens. So, um, and then we figure out why this, this hole that the red team found, the blue team brings it back to the business. Now, now both of us become relevant. 
and get some, some footing under it. Finally, we look at new tools and new processes. I had a very interesting conversation with someone about a month ago, and it was kind of about how they were dumping new tools onto them. And the struggle is, how are we going to deal with this? And as we walked around the, the, the circle of that conversation, it came to, why do they want this tool in place? Can we trade that tool out? Because the real complaint was, I don't have time to learn this tool. I've already got all this stuff. And the question is, can you trade out this new tool for some other tools you're already running? If there's something that's going to be better, faster, more capable, then can we, when we put that piece in, can we decommission something else to reduce the complexity of what we have to deal with so that we can focus here and not continue to spread ourselves like butter thinner and thinner across more pieces of toast? So think about can we trade rather than add? Can we augment um, rather than just keep piling on more as we switch things out? Otherwise, we end up in, the, in this space, right, where we just got so much going on, uh, we're ready to walk out. So this is now, you know, these problems, and I'm walking to a third set of problems, at least my beliefs about the problems. You should be thinking about there are solutions here, and, and we can start creating them. Okay. I'm leaning more and more to the business side. How do we handle business culture? Every place I've gone to, I've, I've found that culture is either supporting or destroying what we're doing. And so as you think about security, we need to think about security in the context of the company and, and how it's going to change the company culture or what we have to do to the company culture in order to make our security move successful. Um, I have been in places where you can't have a conversation with the top of the company at all about security. It's, it's really, it is a check the box thing. And no one really cares. I find myself today in a situation where security is very important to the company and I've had just the strangest conversation with my CEO that was something along the lines of this. As we start to deploy some of these changes that we just talked about, <coughs> I think we have a great culture here, but we're going to have to change some of the ways that people interact because we're going to have to tighten stuff up a bit. And I think it's going to disrupt some people because people love the culture here. And the CEO's answer was, yes, we're going to change the culture. We have to. And if someone has a problem with that, send them to me. I'll let them know this is what we're doing because we have to. Wow. Okay. I can change the culture. It's, I've been given permission to do that. And it got my head into two spaces. Number one is, I really like this. It's nice finally in one of my jobs to have that kind of support. But on the flip side, immediately my head went to, but if I now have carte blanche, so to speak, to start changing the company culture, I better be really, really careful what I do. I better think about what's, what's the, the, the adjustment that I want to do here that's going to get me all that security gain without undermining some other piece that's actually supportive of the change I want. Because he was positive, and everywhere I've gone to the different people, they already have kind of a, yeah, we want to protect stuff. It's just sometimes how they protect it isn't so good. So I'm, I'm going to go touch culture, but I have to think about how I want to touch culture. Um, so how we think about security in the company matters. And then how do our concerns, the way that we interact, how do they get in the way of or support making changes? How do they get in the way or support talking across and talking up and down the chain? Um, I think the business culture has an awful lot to do with can you can you go over your boss's head? And if you do it, I mean, just have a casual conversation. I don't mean to try to, to over, overrun something. I just mean, are you allowed to go talk across the hall? How do you go do that? Some companies, it's really easy to do. If that's the case, then get out of your place and go across the hall and go talk to somebody. One of the best things I've heard about was someone suggested I go talk to the marketing department. I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of fluffy cotton candy over there. <laughs> And then I, I, I came into the thing of realizing 
but you know what? They're so good at making pretty pictures. I suck at that. <laughs> And so I, I've really come to like the marketing department once I have the idea of what I want to do. I'm going to go, I'll go talk to them. And strangely enough, they have a lot of influence with public relations. And public relations has got a certain amount more power on FUD than I do. Because public relations is like, okay, but if this ever happens, we have to have the right story to hand out. These are people who are going to talk about it. And these are people who can't talk about it because they don't talk about it very well. <laughs> And so that's okay. So if I've got friends in marketing and friends in public relations, and I've actually made friends with my compliance officer and had great conversations with him, um, culturally I'm working my way around and, and people are raising issues to go solve. And they're like, well, can't you do that? It's like, well, I think we have to have the message packaged a little bit better. Okay, well, you let me know how we can support you on that. So by the time I actually get to writing my message, which I haven't done yet, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do the message, because I said before I want to touch the culture carefully, I've got all these people that are ready to help me on it. So that's really cool. So, so, so here's where I am at now. I'm kind of transitioning from A to B, right? And, and if, you, if you've been there, you've experienced this, where it's like, oh, how do you solve this problem? And then about the time it's, it starts working, you're like, how, why does this work? I'm not sure how this happened. Um, either one is very vexing. So <clears throat> here's the piece. Let's let's dig into it. I'd like to start solving this. I'd like to start seeing what you guys think on, on, on these points. I think we have issues and failure points. I'm going to ask all of you to, to put on your, your maker, hacker, gamers, Pat, whatever it is, whatever you enjoy doing, and start thinking about these two things, because they exist in any of the problems that you like to solve, regardless of, of whether it's professional or hobby. Here are the problems, I believe. On the business pressure side, we have to be aware of this. And if you're not aware of this in your business, if you don't understand how your business operates the business itself, start learning about it. It, it will probably be very eye-opening, and then you will find a solution to something, and you present it, and it will be just embraced with a big old hug in a way that would, would amaze you. Um, cost is a big issue, obviously, in businesses. Speed to market, capitalization. Uh, have, you, have you ever had that conversation around, we can't buy that because it's not expensive enough? It happens. Um, I have been working recently on a number of very expensive things, six-figure buys, and we're figuring out how to capitalize them because our company likes to capitalize stuff. So that means you look at a license and say, do you like this? Yeah. Do you really like this? Yeah. Okay, so what if we bought it for three years instead of one? Then we can capitalize it. I don't care. <laughs> okay, I'll go get a deal for three years, and I'll probably get a better price. <coughs> Make sure you like what you're about to buy. You're going to have to live with this for three years. Uh, I personally have found that if you're going to buy something, though, a new tool set, a new capability, a new service, it's gonna take you about a year to integrate it. Then you're gonna start really living with it. And then it's gonna, if you decide you don't like it, it's gonna take a year to find something else. So three years actually is not a bad deal. But if it turns out that's the issue, go do it. Other companies don't like to capitalize anything. So don't go them with a three year deal. Figure out how to op exit you know, year over year, here's the expenses and we'll figure out how to save money or something. Um, and, and what the investors return demands are. So this all business stuff, but at least understand how your company approaches it. Because if it matters whether you buy a three-year buyer or a one-year buyer or whatever they want to do, if it matters to them how they want to structure the finances or what color it's supposed to be, then just make it the right color. Solve those business problems as you have the conversation. The second group is kind of a lot of technical pressures. I think we face these. Technology keeps changing pace and it only gets faster. So if you're about to go in to do something it's fairly complex, simplify it first. And this is just something I keep learning. Um, other problems is, is relevance. Relevance fades fast. And another issue is efficiency. Um, and then there's effectiveness, and don't mix up the two. Effectiveness is how good it is at doing what it's supposed to do. It may or may not be the most efficient. Sometimes you have to back off on that. Make the trade. Think about those. And then there's a lot of social pressures. That is, what's the org structure look like? What's the perception of the worth of what you're doing? 
It doesn't matter how valuable it really is if no one understands the value. On the failure point side, um, here's where we'll fall in the pits. Do we use common terms that people understand when we speak when we try to communicate something? Um, do we talk past each other? Let's try not to do that. Do we have recognition? Um, recognition of, you know, there's financial limits. Do we recognize those? Uh, do we see training opportunities and miss them, walk by them? Uh, do we spot things like downtime needs to happen? Uh, planning gets into things like, can we do some things adoption without review? Some things require review before you can adopt something. Is there enough or not enough training or preparation before we bring something new in and take it up as a practice? That will kill you if you bring something in that's really good, but your adoption curve is bad because you didn't train anybody on it. And then your idea will be thrown out. I've learned this over and over again. If I don't prep people to receive the change, then the change was a failure. And then if you try to bring that really good idea back up again, but I'll train you this time, no, nope, we already tried that, that failed. Uh, think about and you know, don't create that failure point um, on the investment side if you ever are asked to budget for something or even if you're not but they're getting ready to do something that is this kind of we're bringing in the new technology we're gonna buy something did they include maintenance support so I can call the vendor so we can do upgrades uh, make sure your costs include that because if you include those costs up front, usually they will get accepted if the whole idea is worth it. But if you forgot and you say, oh, by the way, it's too late, we already spent the money. We'll have to maybe try next year if we can, but that's gonna be a net add to the cost. Um, and then finally, believe it or not, there's internal competition for all sorts of resources, not just money, but time and, and mind share. Uh, getting the ear of top leadership around something. So, so try to make sure you recognize that. Okay. All that is a very long intro to conversation of interoperability. I don't know how long you've been in industry. Some of you may remember interop. Interop, I don't even know if it's still going on anymore. Maybe it still does. Uh, but large conference, the whole focus was that all these vendors would come and they had a, a large interoperability network and you plugged your router or VPN device over there and another competitor plugged theirs in and they would make them interoperate across the network. The stuff worked together. Most stuff just works together very easily today. Um, it, it's not that hard to get things to, to connect and do stuff. It's just that we're doing a lot of connections, a lot of complexity, but the, the base, you know, connecting a VPN isn't that hard anymore. It still goes on, yes. Still, so interop is still going on? Yes. Awesome. I have a suspicion it might, it's, it's, it's not as big as it was. But the idea of interoperability is huge. Uh, just like it addressed the problem of getting systems to network together, the idea that I want to start putting forth is people interoperability. Can we figure out how to work together? So it may look like this, and you can either call this a, su a success or a fail, depending on which side of the, the problem you're on. But uh, no matter what the mess is that we're in or want to create, um, we can get a lot more done if we communicate and work with others. Okay? There's definitely some teamwork going on in this picture. So I want to do that. And I want to also recognize that it's, it's a variety of skills. I talked about red team and blue team before. But it also goes um, ac across the organization to other disciplines. Um, it goes into sec ops, just the day-to-day. -day. <coughs> versus the people that are doing R&D, the next big thing. Um, it goes in talking with developers. Developers are great, or you hate them, depending on which side of the fence you're on. Um, but if we can get everybody to start working in, in together across things, we will solve more problems, and it'll actually be more enjoyable. So here's some of the strategies I'll offer. Think about the words you use and, and the meanings of them. Um, we very often come forward. I'll find I've done this. I've coached people on this, and I've tried to coach myself on this. It's better to come across with a warning than a threat. You know, assume positive intent when someone else is doing something. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean they were trying to get you. 
um, try to outline the issues so that you can talk them through rather than argue about them. If you're going to bring a problem forward, especially if you're bringing something up into management, try to bring the solution with it. Because then you start talking about the solution. If the solution isn't perfect, that's okay. We can tune it. If they start talking about how to fix your solution, we've got engagement. We're talking. So bring solutions with problems. And if you can bring multiple solutions, bring two or three. You may have a favorite, that's okay. They'll pick your favorite, awesome. If they pick a different one, they improve it, it becomes a better solution, great. We've got a solution. And then a lot of times, let's try to get into the nuances uh, and, and, and help expose them. Because sometimes a really important point is, is very subtle. And it's obvious to you, but it's not obvious to the other guy. And so try to figure out what those are and, and share them. If it's a different tool set, it's okay. Let's try a different tool set. Attitude is, is the first thing. If, if you get the attitude right and we're looking at builders, um, we're going to try to do something here. Then, then we're going to engage in, in a very positive way. We're going to be able to move forward. Okay, so. Alternatives. Try to figure out how to do alternatives together. Um, reach across the aisle. That's, that's a big thing I have is reaching across the aisle. Um, try to figure out how to find more resources. If it's not immediately available, hackers will do this all the time. I'll go out and I'll go find another tool set. I'll go search for a script. Someone else has done this. Someone else has done something like this. We'll, we'll try to start making it work. And um, look at a method that's different. If the automated thing just won't work, maybe you can do it manually. If, if it's done manually, maybe we can improve it and find a script for it. Uh, maybe we can put a little bit of both together until we can build the tool that needs to solve it. And with that, I do believe we can work across the different groups. We can get people talking with each other and starting to solve the business problems. We can actually manage upwards. Uh, you can influence your boss if you start the approach correctly. And I think we'll get a lot more out of the diversity. People talk about diversity in the environment and how to get the most out of it. I think we'll get the most out of it by starting to grab a hold of the diversity and saying, okay, let's work together, but you have to reach across the aisle. So with that, um, I introduced the initial problem. Uh, how are we gonna get more out of security? I want to raise the security bar in the profession. Uh, I wanna solve more of the problems in the workplace. Uh, I'd really like to kind of turn it now and ask, you know, here's my ideas. What have you seen out there that's a really sticky problem you haven't solved? Let's talk about it. We have you know, 20, 30 people that are smart people in this room that might have an idea to solve a question that you've got. Or if you've got something you've done recently that was sticky and you found a way around it, I'd love to have people share on it. Thoughts on managing upwards. So this, I'll, I'll start with that. How do you manage upward? I'd go ahead, go ahead. Uh, Who passes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> uh, in your daily interactions with management, how often is the word security used in those dialogues versus risk? Yeah. Um, risk used to be a lot about financial risk and physical risk. I think the, converse, the conversation is starting to now get really into risk, and security is almost fading away in some corners. Um, I'm not sure if I like that, but I'm having to change the conversations I have with, with other leaders to talk about the business risk of something. Um, I think it's going to go back and forth because 
the way we solve the risk is with controls and control. I guess maybe that's the thing. We, we're used to talking about security and attack and defense, and the business is more used to talking about either risk or controls. Okay, so we'll take whatever your question is and turn it in either, to either a risk or into a control. And now we'll talk about it. It's probably the exact same thing. Words are important, and, and they're changing. Yeah. I would say right now I'm trying to replace a uh, database application from 17 years ago, uh, Lotus Approach. Uh, okay. We kept, haven't heard of that, but yeah. okay. So we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, uh, we've kept it secure by keeping it off the internet, and, but now we have to work between two locations. So, uh, and I'm, now we travel regularly anyway, I'm about to With say. With the tape, right? I'm about to say USB stick. Uh, USB, what? Uh, connect the two together, uh, sync the two together, leave it off the internet, just, just to keep it secure. Because I'm gonna be spending more time trying to keep it secure if it's up to the internet than I am syncing it up. But anyway, what you said, uh, uh, give them a warning first instead of a threat, I'm, I'm I, my understanding is as soon as we plug that uh, Ethernet cable in and hook to the web, NSA has definitely got access to yeah, it. Yeah, it's and who, knows, who knows who else. Uh, so what are, what are the conversations you're having right now about this? Because, I, I mean, what I hear are, are you're raising the immediate, this wasn't designed to work in this world we live in today. Right. I mean, the, the, but, but the other thing I hear is, and in a few more years, it's it's kind of like finding the COBOL programmers. Right, I, and I, I'm i gonna take that approach that I'm, sync it up with a USB, keep it off the web to keep it secure until we can find a neural uh, app that gets the job done, and I've just about found one. But, but what you said is good. Uh, warning, warnings go better than threats. So have you talked about the investment to get to a supportable platform? Uh, well, 10 bucks for a USB stick for right now, and then... Uh, <laughs> and people and, running it back and forth. And yeah. the risk of dropping the USB stick? Uh, a secured USB stick that has a password encrypted that deletes itself if somebody doesn't have the right okay. password. But uh, I do have an app that somebody's gonna offer to me for free, so I like that price. Um, that's a- Yeah, management likes free. Yeah, they like that. I have someone that their negotiating technique is cost minus cost. Yes. <laughs> I, I got that at the Wolfram Technology Conference, Wolfram Research Mathematica, uh, so they're now able to put some database applications into it in the more recent versions of their software. Uh, but anyway, my budget process before that, when the equipment wasn't working, was, okay, we'll let it break and then see if they wanna replace it. Uh, and you know, let people get fired over that sometimes, but I didn't know how to else get the point across uh, before that. So, but that wasn't as much security related as what we're talking about here. So, says the conversation started. Uh, I uh, try to not say a whole lot until I have to, uh, but yeah, the conversation's definitely started. I just, okay. I just try. It. Uh, I don't know. I'm a kind of a one man IT department. I know nothing about IT, and that's why I'm here. Uh, so that's why I go to the NLOG, users group, Linux, et cetera. That's why I do a Wolfram conferences. But uh, I got stuck with IT responsibilities because I created this database app 17 years ago. Uh, it doesn't mean I know everything about it. It was a great so, idea at the time, right? <laughs> yeah. You just haven't had time to, to, yeah. to keep moving forward. Yeah, I kept trying to figure out how we're gonna get this going for the future when this day comes, and now it's here. And uh, But anyway, I like your suggestion. Uh, uh, warnings, they go they go a long way. Uh, yeah, rather the threats. Rest. And then I, I, I we'll go from there. But I like this mention, which is talking about risks. So that's the yeah. next thing is, is talk about what are the risks if we can't get this converted, and, and maybe they'll try to speed it up a little bit. But uh, yeah, definitely leave your email up when your slide's over. Um, okay. Actually, I'll go back to the very beginning. Yeah, here. I can take it. Yeah, it can be. Please. I think there's a real opportunity for IT people to educate throughout the company. I think we're in a different world now than we were a couple years ago because of all the breaches and all the publicity. So the general public is a lot more interested than they would have been, you know, five years ago. And I think when people are people are curious, and that that extends to management. 
And so to the extent that IT people can educate, not just the problems, because everybody's heard about Target and they've heard about Sony, everybody gets that, but what are the solutions? What are the things you can do? And that message coming from the IT department, but like you said, also the CEO. So one of the things that, for example, corporate boards are hearing now is that every board meeting should include a session on cybersecurity. Now that's just a, that's a huge change from where we have been. And of course, you're talking to people who don't know anything about it. So to the extent you can feed that and play off of that and educate people and give them solutions, I think management and other people and throughout, not just in companies but in the public, they're more interested now in what we have to say. The other thing that's very true is there are more opportunities to have the conversation. It is getting up to the board. I think the messaging for the board is very challenging because they talk of things at such an abstracted level that um, you have to present it as risk. But the point of people talking about it just in general means that there may be other conversations happening around the company. Um, if you can't get the concern you have about security straight up to the board, but you can talk to other people about solutions, or at least what's happening out there, and, and what you know, what some of the things are that have to be fixed, and other people start talking up their chains, if someone talks up on the revenue side of the business about a problem, because they've talked with you about it, and you say, well, you know, there are solutions for this, and he gives them some ideas, the revenue side can usually get what they want because they're revenue. Um, so I think maybe that idea of starting to talk with people because it's topical now and sharing about what you're seeing around you. Yeah, this is these are some of the risks we're having inside the company. You might be able to get support for something that otherwise um, people aren't supporting. Wouldn't it make sense at one point then to do like an ROI of this is what it is going to cost to spend one week, four hours, you know, pull people from each department for X amount of hours and have one person come in and say, this is what we need from you to do to secure your section and this is why. And if you've got an ROI that says you'll spend this much to train these people, on basic security procedures, and this is what it's going to cost you in potential loss. And if, if they've got that to look at just in very, very simplistic terms, without any big words or any long explanations. Yeah, so what are the things that we can think about that are, if you're gonna do the ROI, and you talk about potential loss, so you're on the right track, what are the potential losses in the business? that we think we can talk about, that, that can be simple. Reputation. Reputation your, loss, okay, the yeah. View, your community's view, the community's view on your business, because no matter how great your business is, if everybody in the community looks at you as a risk, oh, they had a data breach. You know, they let everybody's phone numbers go out and I've gotten 85 phone calls from a telemarketer. It, even something as simple as that is going to cause somebody to go, well, maybe I won't go here. I'll go over here to spend. Okay. So start looking at that. Start looking at reputational costs. So the impact could be less lowered revenue. Could be more phone calls into your support line saying, what are you doing about this? Now that something bad has happened, what would the cost of that be? Um, lawsuits. lawsuits. You know the interesting thing about lawsuits that, that I've been finding out as I keep looking at that? They don't typically win the lawsuit. They settle. Settling is really expensive. It's a lot less than losing the lawsuit. Um, but the cost, if, if you can try to find, and try to find something relevant to your industry, what, what is costing to settle? What is it costing to avoid the lawsuit? Um, there's some numbers to put up behind the ROI and then try to figure out if you're gonna have those conversations like at like four hours a week and you're gonna rotate through the organization, okay, we can probably estimate the cost of that and, and then offer up what we're gonna do. So solutioning sessions, that's, that's a good idea. I think you can start building an ROI out around that. If you're only talking an hour a week, 
the best solution suggestion is lunch and provide lunch. So make sure you include lunch in that cost because lunch otherwise you're taking lunch. away time that they would be doing their job. So you would have to include that in your ROI. So, you, so the expense of your education program is going to be a couple of Subway and a couple of pizzas? Pretty much. It's not very expensive. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Your, your, your staff is going to appreciate it. Yeah, so now you get people engaged because you gave them free pizza. It's not an, oh man, I have to go to this super stupid training session. It's like, hey, they're going to give us lunch today. Yeah, there you go. I'll jump in with uh, one other thing, which if you all are here and listening to Michael, then uh, you are definitely interested in trying to bridge that gap between tech and executives. Uh, when you get home this next week, look for the B-Sides Nashville videos and look at his talk on how to communicate and how to build charts for execs. It's well worth the 50 minutes uh, to sit in front of YouTube for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I did that talk twice this year. And if you only have 25 minutes, you can watch the one that I did in Las Vegas. I think, I think the second time I did a better job of it. But uh, the first time there, so the second time was just a lot of me talking, but it was very condensed. And the second time, we had some people in the audience asking some really good questions um, and, and offering some ideas. But yeah, so if you're gonna present something, if you do have to present something to the executives or the boards, um, how you package it up is important. Pretty having, pictures. But having continuity with the presenter be important too. You find the one person that's capable of talking to the administrative assistant group. That is okay. So that's a huge point. Yes. Yeah, so so what she just said was continuity of presenter. If you have someone that works really well talking to the admin assistants have them continue to be that person. I like to call that an ambassador. And it doesn't have to be somebody on the security team, but if you find someone that talks well with them and, and engages well with them, and then whoever's gonna talk to the board, it's better to have the same person talk to the board or the same person talk to the CFO or whoever it is you're talking to. They build trust through relationship. I, I'll walk in here and I know uh, very few of you. And so, might be a great talk or something, but maybe not. And if I'm saying, let me now go solve the problem at your company, you're like, eh, I don't know about that. I don't know you. But if you have the same person over and over talking with these people and they're building trust, you'll get a lot further. So that's a great idea. Yes. Think about it. If you're starting to do this continuity of who's talking to people in, in each of these groups. Well, it's, it's, and this isn't really about managing up. But it doesn't have to be about managing up. Okay. We're just trying to talk about how to build the bridges. My, my problem... And, it, and I don't think it's a manager versus a individual contributor problem. Um, is I think that the security industry in and of itself is still rather immature. Yes. And and hasn't developed, frankly, even a common lexicon that works across the entire industry. Yes. Uh, as well as not not to mention processes, right? So I may, for instance, uh, I mean, I'm gonna use some terrible examples, but like I'm sure most people in the security space would understand what shell shock is, or a common malware, let's say, uh, I don't know, Zeus, right? Um, but you know, what, what is the right way to handle that patching versus uh, shell, or uh, you know, patching shell shock versus Zeus, which I know they're not related, but point being, like, I don't think we even understand uh, what, what we're actually trying to achieve, we just know we got to go stop shell shock, or we just got to prevent Zeus from getting in the network. Sure. And so the in-business goals aren't clear to management or the individual contributors, and that just makes the entire conversation harder. So I think my, my personal opinion is that to solve the problem, we have to get to a common agreed upon lexicon and then processes. So, so and, and I'll tell you what, let me, let me stop there, because I want to respect the time on the next you know, person is going to come in and present. I appreciate all of you kind of hanging out for this. We do need to figure out what our common language is. We do need to recognize that even when we get to that common lexicon, there's going to be pockets where we're specialized, and that's okay. We have to figure out how to talk across the specializations when we need to in, in more accessible language, more open language, more business language. Um, and we have to be willing to say, I don't know, or can you explain that to me? How, how does that affect what we're doing? So if we can start doing those things, if we can work on building bridges, 
we're going to mature our profession. This is a profession we're in. It is a young profession. Um, let's figure out how to get better at it with all of our peers in the profession, no matter how different it is what they're doing. If we can start doing that, then I think in the next five to ten years, we're going to look at InfoSec very differently, and it's going to be having a huge, powerful impact in a positive way on the business. And, and we'll wonder how we got there, uh, but it's going to be kind of us that did it. And so that's my invitation. Um, I have some, some cards if you want to you know, exchange ideas, talk on Twitter. This is a very new idea for me, but I would love your suggestions and input and, and conversation across the community about how we get better at building bridges. I just think it's critical, and just as much as we're passionate about security, we're going to make that passion realized as we talk with each other. So thank you very much.